Good morning, everybody. So I'm uh, Ronald Hanson. This is my first quantum crypto conference. I'm actually an experimental quantum physicist. Uh, so I like it up to now. Let's see how it is after my talk, if you uh, like it or not. Uh, the reason that I'm here and uh, telling you a bit about the experiments is that the experiments that we're doing now are, I believe, becoming interesting to uh, this community. So the overall aim of my group uh, is to build quantum networks. And the quantum network, uh, by that I mean a network uh, of small nodes that contain few qubits and that are co connected via quantum channels. And the way you want to build this up uh, is uh, the following. This one goes fast. So we are, our local nodes will consist of nuclear spins that act as qubits. And in our case, we will work in diamond. We will use the nuclear spin of uh, carbon-13 atoms. And these nuclear spins will be coupled to an electron spin. In our case, the electron spin of an MV center defect. And this MV, this, uh, MV center electron spin we can uh, address optically. So using this optical interface, we can uh, address and read out these individual nuclear spins. And now to connect these different nodes, we will use uh, interference of single photons emitted by these uh, electron spins uh, and a measurement of them. And I think in this community you call this uh, entanglement swapping. So by entanglement swapping we can make entanglement between the different nodes. So this is what uh, the in-v-center actually uh, looks like in the letter. So there's a nitrogen atom and replacing a carbon atom and then uh, one of the carbon atoms next to it is missing. So it's the vacancy, NV. Uh, so the electrons that we're talking about will be trapped here. Uh, and then we'll be talking to nuclear spins that will be uh, close by in, in, in the letters. So the, the uh, typical device that we, uh, that we work on looks like this. Uh, so this is an electron microscope image. The gray is, uh, is diamond. These diamonds are grown in the lab, not in our lab, but by uh, collaborators. And this diamond is, is really, really extremely pure. So the number of defects in this diamond is, is uh, uh, way less than a part per billion. And within these diamonds, we uh, look for MV centers. And once we uh, found them, we make this uh, sort of photonic structure on top of them. And we put gates uh, on the surface of the diamond in, in the clean room. And uh, using these several gates, we can then uh, control and address the spins. So for example, this is part of a microwave strip line. Uh, and that we can use to, to control the spins using magnetic resonance. So we just apply microwave pulses that are resonant with the spin transition. And this causes the uh, uh, spin to oscillate fast. And you can see here, this is on. We can do pretty good pi pulses on a time scale of a few tens of nanoseconds. Now, if we cool down the sample below 10 Kelvin and we uh, shine a laser across the optical transition, we observe very sharp peaks. Uh, so this is uh, uh, what we see here are actually uh, discrete optical transitions. They're very much similar to uh, what you would see in uh, trapped ions. So these transitions are also spin preserving. And that we can use to uh, efficiently initialize and to uh, read out the, the electron spin. Now, oh. the electron spin also has a very long lifetime. We have uh, developed a technique called uh, dynamical decoupling. It actually comes out of uh, NMR and ESR. And with this technique, we can get coherence times of the electron spin that are approaching uh, about a second. So it's really, it's really long lived quantum states within the node. And finally, as I was saying, uh, we also want to control nuclear spins. And so if nuclear spins are relatively close to the electron spin, they are coupled via hyperfine interaction. Uh, and using this hyperfine interaction, we can actually uh, initialize, uh, control, and read out individual nuclear spins. And these nuclear spins will, in the end, be the, the qubits in our node. So this is sort of the toolbox that we have. With this toolbox, uh, we can do several experiments. And there are two experiments that I want to discuss today. Uh, the first experiment is on teleportation, uh, and the second experiment, uh, so the first one we actually did, and the second experiment is an experiment that we really want to do, uh, uh, a loop for free belt test. So let's start with teleportation. Um, I think people here have heard talks about teleportation zillions of times, uh, and so to actually make clear what is different in our experiments from all the other experiments, it's good to go back to the source and see what they say about why teleportation is can be useful, or what's interesting, or what is unique. Uh, so some people in this audience wrote down uh, this sentence, somewhere in their paper in the Outlook. They say if you have this, you know, if you have, a, I think the words are, if you have a stockpile of EPR pairs, then uh, Alice can teleport quantum states above over arbitrarily great distances, so this is keyword, without worrying about the effects of attenuation and noise. 
So in my words, this would be teleportation allows for quantum state transfer with unit efficiency. It works every time. In principle, unit fidelity, it works. You know, the state arrives at the other side perfectly. And this can be done independent of the distance. And I think the combination of these three things, that this is really unique about quantum teleportation. Uh, and as far as I know, there has not been any single experiment that has shown all three at the same time. And why is that? Well, it's actually a very hard experiment if you want to do it in the, the, the way that it uh, was proposed originally. So in the original proposal, uh, there, there are three qubits. Alice has two of them. There's an EPR pair, and the state psi is encoded in uh, uh, one of the other qubits of, of Alice. And the teleportation uh, you know, has the, the bell state measurement, the feed forward of the, of the uh, outcome of the bell state measurement, and then the uh, conditional operation on the other side. Now, these three steps uh, are already difficult, but there's actually a fourth, fourth step that is sort of ignored here, and that is, of course, that you have to create this entanglement. And if you want to have uh, qubits you know, connected over large distance, then this, this is actually quite hard. So let's see, what are the challenges if we want to do remote teleportation and we also want to work, you know, to have this done unconditionally? So we have to be able to get entanglement between these remote qubits. So for that, we have to use a photonic channel. Right? There's no way around it. We want this bell state measurement to be deterministic. So that means every time I uh, do the measurement, I will get you know, one of the four answers that, uh, that can be there with pretty high fidelity. And that means that we actually want to use matter qubits. So we know that with single photons, we cannot do this, at least with linear optics and uh, uh, detectors. And with matter qubits, as I will show you, we can actually do this uh, quite reliably. And then finally, there's this active feed forward and the conditional operation, and we want to do this in, in real time so that we can really say that the, the state is here on the other side now. It's, it's really there at this point in time. And that means that these qubits have to be long-lived, right? So during this whole process, this qubit has to stay uh, coherent. And then vCenters actually satisfy all the requirements that we, that we have here. So how do we entangle remote qubits? So as I said, we use the, uh, the principle of uh, entanglement swapping. Uh, we create entanglement between spin and photon on each side. We let the photons uh, interfere on the beam splitter and we check for photon detection. And the beauty of these protocols is actually that it's heralded. This is, for us, this is, this is crucial because the, the, the photon loss that we have from here to here is uh, enormous. But it doesn't really matter because, you know, if the protocol fails, there, there are no clicks. We just try again. And if the protocol works, we get these clicks and we know uh, there's the herald that says, okay, now you have entanglement. And the, the entanglement that we then have is actually not affected by photon loss, to first order. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of the, the scheme that we use exactly. It's uh, the scheme described in here. Uh, but what I should say is that we use uh, the degree of freedom of the photon that we use is photon number. So we uh, create entanglement between spin and photon number here. OK, so this is an experiment that we did uh, about uh, two years ago. Uh, so there's the diamond. Here's the lab. You can see from the scale bar that this is about uh, three meters between the two setups. So there's a cryostat here holding one diamond. This is not to scale, of course. Uh, there's another diamond here. It's also <laughs> cooled down by four Kelvin or so, and there's this whole forest of uh, mirrors and so that actually have to make this, uh, this whole thing happen. So we did this entanglement swapping, and then every time the photons uh, or the, the photo detectors heralded you know, the entanglement generation, we did uh, the readout on both sides to see if there were the, the correlations that we wanted, uh, and indeed there were. So if you measure both spins in the z direction, you see a strong anti-correlation. And then if you tilt your head and you say, okay, what are you in, in, in x direction? And we also see correlation that's a bit weaker, though. Um, but, it, but it's there. So from these numbers, from, from this data, you can actually extract the fidelity to the ideal Bell state, which in this first experiment was 73%. And I think this is a, also a very important number to mention, is that the success probability is, is really, really low. So it only worked 1 in 10 million times. And that's really due to the, you know, they were really bad at actually taking the photons out and getting them out to the beam strip. So it's quite remarkable that despite that, this success probability, we can actually get, uh, you know, state fidelity uh, you know, above uh, 50%. So this was the, the first experiment. Uh, so we had to re repeat this when we wanted to do teleportation. Uh, and then we knew how to avoid all the stupid mistakes. So we got uh, uh, quite a bit better. Uh, so now, in the second experiment, we got 87% state fidelity. 
Uh, we got a bit better at making entanglements. Now it's like about six times faster. Um, still very slow, but it's actually the difference, you know, between integrating for two weeks and integrating for two days. And that's, so, you know, you can understand that some people in the lab are very happy with this factor of six. Okay. So now let's go on to the, uh, to the experiment. So what we wanted to show is uh, unconditional teleportation, qubit teleportation, uh, between two setups that are disconnected, huh, that are uh, remote. And so in, in other words, this, this unconditional is quite a technical term, but I, 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 what it means to me is that each time Alice inserts a state into the teleporter, it should come out on Bob's end. So when you say, okay, now I'm going to do teleportation, it has, you know, the state has to arrive at the other side. Otherwise, you don't fulfill this. So the way we uh, implement this is uh, in the following circuit diagram, uh, and it it's actually has, you know, the, the, the following control pulses that we uh, apply. It's not so uh, relevant for you to understand exactly what everything means. I just want to highlight this this part here, which is uh, the bell state measurement, because that's it. This is a part that we can uh, um, validate independently. So what we actually did is well. What we did was uh, to, to create different types of entangled states here, so the four different bell states actually, and then run our bell state uh, measurement on it and see if it actually gave the right answer. And so the blue bars are the experiment, uh, the data, and uh, this orange is, uh, is a model that incorporates all the errors that we know. And we indeed see that, you know, for example, if we make psi, uh, phi minus, then indeed the, the measurement says phi minus. <coughs> So this data showed that the, we can distinguish between all four bell states in single shot, uh, and the, the average fidelity that we get here is 93%, and that's for people doing uh, like qubit experiments, they will realize that this is a, actually a pretty good number because you know, it involves uh, uh, quite a number of gates, and we're reading out two qubits. So we're very happy with this number, and indeed this number is actually key to the uh, con unconditional teleportation experiment functioning. So then uh, we, we do the uh, real experiment, and then of course you have to prove to somebody else that you're doing teleportation, that you're actually doing, that this is a quantum process. So uh, we chose to, uh, to, to create six different input states on Alice's side and teleport them, and then measure the uh, uh, fidelity uh, of the state that we end up with, with the, uh, with the ideal state on the other side. And then you get uh, teleportation fidelities for all the states. So again, blue is the data. And the important thing now is that if you take the average of that, uh, which is this bar, it should be above two thirds to beat uh, a classical limit. And so indeed we are well above two thirds. Uh, in fact, this is the raw data. And I think the, uh, the actual number that we get when we correct for initialization errors is about 86%. So this shows that uh, we are doing quantum teleportation. It's a quantum process. Uh, and what is actually new in this experiment compared to what has been done before I believe is that it's both unconditional. So, you know, every time we say we do the teleportation, the state comes out on the other side. All data is taken into account. And it's scalable to long distance because of the uh, heralding of the uh, entanglement generation. So we first make the entanglement, and then we do everything else. And that makes it, in principle, scalable to longer distance. Okay. So that, I'm going to switch to the, uh, to the second experiment, um, the loophole-free bell test. Now, we've had this uh, beautiful introduction this morning already, so you know everything about the bell test. Probably most of you already knew that uh, before. But just uh, briefly, the bell experiments up to now have been plagued by uh, two loopholes, so two main loopholes, the locality loophole, which has been addressed uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in Paris in 82 and uh, later on by many other people. And there's the uh, detection loophole, which has been addressed now in uh, several experiments, but of course the uh, you know, the experiment that we, that we really want is the one that has the detection loophole closed and also is addressing the locality loophole. This experiment has not been done. So you actually may note that I use different verbs here. I have a close and address here, and I will say something about that later on. So a year ago when we were running these teleportation experiments and we, we got a feeling for the, for the numbers that we could achieve, we thought, uh, okay, let's, let's do a calculation and see if we can actually violate Bell's inequality over, over some decent distance, do a loop of free Bell test. So we took uh, the, the numbers that were sort of the optimistic best numbers that we had at that time. Uh, so we could do a readout within three microseconds, Bell state fidelity about 85%, readout fidelity 98%, uh, and actually losses, we were a bit too, too pessimistic, but uh, we're now using uh, light at 640 nanometers, which is uh, extremely lossy in, in fiber, so 
yeah, these losses are, are big. So if we then plot the uh, bell signal just using a CSSH inequality as a function of the fiber length, uh, and you get uh, this curve, which is going down uh, actually because of these losses. And you can see, well, you can see two uh, no-go regions here. So if I'm, if the distance between Alice and Bob is smaller than a kilometer, um, we do not close uh, the locality loophole because you know the readout time is three microseconds, so that's 900 meters, and you need you have some additional time to generate your, your basis choice. That's not, that's not going to work. If we go too far, we actually uh, drop below two, so that, that's not good. But the good news is that in this white area, there's a window of, of opportunity where our system could actually do a loophole-free uh, belt test. So I will, I will show you now the, oh, oh, let's go back. I will show you now the uh, experimental scheme in a, a space-time diagram, what we uh, want to do, and go through it uh, step by step. So we'll have Alice and Bob separated by at least one kilometer. Uh, there will be a beam splitter station, uh, preferably uh, in the middle, you know, that we use for the entanglement swapping to create the entangled state. Um, and so we will start, one back, we will start, of course, with initialization. So first we have to reset our spins into uh, an unknown state. And we do this via optical pumping. So these are the two uh, qubit states that we use, and we just pump on one of them, and there's a small probability, once it's in the excited state, that it drops over to the other side. So this optical pumping we use to initialize, it's actually quite fast, a few microseconds, and it has a very high fidelity. So that's fine. Then the second step, we have to start to uh, generate entanglement between the two MV centers. So we first create spin photon entanglement. So first we apply a microwave pulse that creates a spin superposition here. And once we have that, we apply uh, an optical pi pulse that brings this population up here, and then we wait for a photon to be emitted. Uh, and after that time, we will have entanglement between spin and number of photons in the system. Um, these photons will uh, travel to the beam splitter station. They meet here, and uh, once in a while, uh, we get the right pattern of clicks that we want, uh, and you know, the entanglement will be heralded. And it says, okay, now you have entanglement. So far, so good. Now, um, because our, uh, uh, the uh, probability that we actually get entanglement is very low, we want to get the repetition rate up. So we want to start with measuring the spins as fast as possible. And as fast as possible actually means that we can start right here. At this point, so actually we start, well, so we start with the random number generation right here. So we have to be above this line, because if we do it below this line, then the random bit that we generate could actually travel to the beam splitter. And since I, I, I told you that this, this heralding is probabilistic, then the beam splitter could maliciously select out the events where you know, the random bits gave the right values that, that it liked. So because we don't have 100% efficiency here, we actually have to wait until uh, you know, we, we are crossing this line here. So once we're here, we can generate the random bit. Fine, we get the random bit. And then we start our readout. Well, we start our readout. Um, and this readout is single shot. And it's basically state-dependent fluorescence. So we, we drive this transition. Uh, and if we are spin up, we would see photons. If we don't see photons, we say it's spin down. So the detection loophole is closed. Um, and this process, so in, in our best devices, we have a fidelity of about 98%. And now, of course, one of the challenges is to get two devices that you know, work at the, at the optimal uh, fidelity. Now, this is the start of the measurement. Uh, now, for the end of the measurement, uh, we, have to be, we have to stop the measurement before we cross this line here. And this line is just that you know, the random bits from Alice can travel all the way to, to Bob. So, this is just a, a condition that we are space-time separated. So we end here, and that's, uh, that's the end of the measurement. And so if, this, uh, if, we, if we make sure that we stop here, then the locality loophole is addressed. And why do I say addressed for the locality loophole, and why do I say closed for the detection loophole? Um, well, the reason is very simple, is that uh, I, I can say that my measurement ends here, but actually we don't have a good definition of when the measurement ends. Right? It's sort of an assumption that we have to make. We have to make it plausible that this is, this is the end of the measurement. But there's no, yeah, we, we cannot prove that the measurement really ends here. Right? There's, so there's a signal that travels, okay, it goes through the photo detector and there's a current in the photo detector. And then uh, it goes to your hard drive and at some point maybe I see it with my eyes, it will be much later. Um, but we, we have to cut the measurement somewhere. So in our case it's just when we turn off the laser uh, and there's no interaction with our 
uh, system anymore. That's what we call the, the end of the measurement. Okay, so uh, th that looks good. Um, now we want to implement that. So what we did is uh, we took the uh, map of uh, the, the campus of TU Delft and actually this building here is the physics building and all the experiments that, that I showed you were, uh, were performed right here. And so what we did is just draw a circle of uh, one kilometer around and see if there's a building that could you know, sort of be a good lab for us. And we found one here on the other side of the campus. So the campus actually runs like this. So uh, Bob has a lab installed uh, right here. Uh, this Bob is uh, operational since uh, two weeks. And we have a fiber running all, uh, all the way across campus, or underneath campus. So the two labs uh, are connected, and the beam splitter station is actually right here. So it's not exactly in the middle, but okay, you have to do some compromise. So it's right here. So everything is uh, sort of there. Distance is 1.3 kilometers, so we actually have a bit more time than this uh, uh, three microseconds. Uh, and now we have to make it happen. So this is an uh, ongoing experiment, and we hope to at least start the experiment this year, and then, uh, and then uh, yeah, we'll see what comes out. So for the, uh, for the outlook, so the, the longer term, I talk mostly about uh, this work, um, but actually uh, half of my group is working more on quantum computation, and there we're really using these nuclear spins as, as a quantum bit. So we're implementing quantum algorithms and so on. Uh, and so we have a you know, big area here. I think what will be very interesting is when we can, can combine these two and really get networks, uh, you know, networks of, of uh, diamonds that have a few qubits that are connected to each other. Uh, and these are sort of a list of experiments that we want to do in the next uh, few years. So with that, I come to the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, I want to thank people in my group. I want to thank these funding agencies. And uh, thank you for your attention. You want to do a belt set measurement with two NV centers or their nuclear spins. I suppose they need to be identical, so same ground set splitting. There's certainly some conditions on making it possible. How, what do you rely on? Is it just pure chance to find two spins that are sufficiently close and satisfy that condition, or is there any way to tune that actively to make two things indistinguishable? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very uh, relevant question. So um, we work in a, in a solid state, which has some advantages, right? Our, our atoms are always trapped. Um, but if you take two NV centers in the diamond, they're, they're never exactly the same. Um, now, if they are a bit different in spin properties, that's fine. We don't really care. But we do care about the uh, uh, emission frequencies, because the uh, photons that we send out to the beam splitter have to be indistinguishable. Otherwise, the entanglement swapping doesn't work. Uh, and so what we see is, uh, to, to, to give you some numbers, the uh, uh, line width is, uh, say, uh, 50 megahertz or so, and we see spread of uh, emission frequencies of a few gigahertz. But we can actually use a DC Stark effect with these uh, gate electrodes that you saw on the surface. We can actually tune over that same range. So in principle, we can, we, we can bring them on resonance. Um, so that's not so much of an issue. On the other hand, if you tune uh, this, you're also tuning other properties of the NV sensor. You have to be a little bit careful. And what we're, actually, what we're doing now is uh, we, we have a big spreadsheet, which we call the matchmaker. And it has all the uh, the uh, NV centers that we know from different samples. And we're really looking, OK, which ones would be good enough? Because uh, it's not only that they have to be close in resonance, but also the readout fidelity has to be very high. Right? So if read they don't all have this 98% readout fidelity. So we need, there, there's, there's some restrictions, but we have, uh, I think, about three uh, pair candidates that, would, that yeah, should be good enough. Would there be an advantage to just using a modulator to shift the frequency of the photons to match? So in other words, instead of trying to shift the quantum dot with the Stark effect, just go through an AOM or something like that. Yeah, uh, we, we actually uh, did think about that. Uh, um, so with an AOM, uh, fast AOM, you can shift uh, gigahertz uh, even. I mean, you could also do it with, uh, yeah. So, so, so that's sort of the range, but um, uh, you will lose some. So there's, there's some uh, input loss. Uh, and in the end, we decided that it's, it's just as easy to do it with uh, these gates. It's, it's sort of a static effect. You tune it once, and then it's just at that frequency. So and because we're very, we really need all the photons that are coming out of the system, because we're really the, the bottleneck is the uh, repetition rate here. Uh, we, we decided to use the gates. But, but in principle, this is, this is an option indeed. Yeah. Uh, can you explain a little bit more how you come up with this uh, three microsecond measurement time? What, what do you have to do? And, uh, to, to what are the operation which ends up in three microseconds as a measurement time? 
Yes. Um, so the measurement. Uh, oh. So this is the measurement. Um, so what we do is we uh, turn on a laser that's uh, resonant for one of the uh, spin transitions uh, and just look for photons. And so th then it becomes a matter of can we, uh, if photons are, so, so the, the photons are emitted continuously and in three microseconds that's, uh, um, uh, so it's about one uh, photon per uh, 20 nanoseconds or so, so that's uh, 50, so okay, uh, 150 uh, photons or so. Uh, and we have to be pretty sure that if there, there are 150 volts, we catch actually one. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, collection efficiency mostly, which is about 10% uh, in our case. So we catch about 10% of the photons. Um, and and uh, driving this uh, t transition, yeah, b b basically in saturation. But that's, yeah, that's, there's uh, so much you, you can do in driving this transition. So I guess, you know, just the rate of photons coming out is fixed. And it's really up to us just catching enough photons uh, in time within this uh, Three microseconds. Actually, we see that if we would allow for longer time, our readout efficiency goes up a little bit. So we are we, we are cutting off the readout a little bit if we uh, stick to three microseconds. And you stop when you get enough photons so that you can discriminate uh, in which state you are. This yeah, is. yeah. But of course, this readout time we have to uh, determine beforehand. Uh, and it's just so if if we do this often and often, we see that the, the readout fidelity saturates close to uh, three microseconds. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, so that indeed after three microseconds, if we had not seen the photon, then the probability is 98% uh, yeah, that there was no photon at all. 